In this video, I'll be going over five brutally honest reasons why you're struggling to get a job in data. But I won't just leave you hanging, I'll also be sharing practical advice on how you can overcome these hurdles and start seeing better results. Let's get into it. The data job market is tough. It's competitive, it's saturated, and it's difficult to know how to stand out. This is especially true for entry-level roles. But there are a few big reasons why you're probably struggling that are completely independent from the market. Number one, you don't actually have the skills. Let me be real, just because you've taken an online course in SQL doesn't automatically make you a pro. Let me even take that a step further and say that just because you've taken an online bootcamp doesn't automatically make you a pro. Sometimes I encounter encounter individuals who might interact with or work with on LinkedIn who make the mistake of taking a course or earning a certification, checking it off the list, and thinking that they're good. I've even spoken to people in coaching calls who've spent thousands on online boot camps and still don't even know basic SQL concepts. It is wild. These deficits become very obvious, and these individuals are often left disillusioned when they don't get calls back. So what should you do? Well, you need to keep your skills sharp. Continue to revisit your tech stack daily or at least a few times a week throughout the entire interview process. You need to continue building proficiency and keep those skills top of mind. Do this in the form of personal projects, visiting platforms like Dataford for SQL problems, or even taking an additional online course. The key here is just to not settle and to keep improving week by week. Speaking of projects, let's move on to number two. Your projects aren't good. Similar to the first point, I often talk to people who think that just because they have a portfolio with a few projects in it, that they should be offered a job. They think, I have a portfolio, but where's my job? They put their portfolios together and then they scratch their heads when they don't get any interviews. But then I take a look at their projects and I find something interesting, or should I say, not very interesting at all. Projects just aren't good. Either it's a really ugly dashboard, the project isn't presented well enough, or it's just flat out basic or even sloppy. So there are two things here. The first is that you have to be honest with yourself. Take an unbiased look at yourself and ask yourself, is this project good? And hey, I get it. Not every project is going to look amazing when you're new to a particular skill. But that's why my second point is to keep making new projects. Really, you should be creating one new project per week throughout the job hunting process. Start off with a portfolio of about three to five projects. And then once you start actively applying, continue to work on one project per week to continue continue flexing your ability. This is how you add even better projects to your portfolio, but also again, how you keep those skills top of mind. By the way, if you need help putting together a portfolio, I put together a step-by-step -step video on how to do this that I'll link in the description below. Now let's talk about number three, your resume is lacking. Resumes are tough and it doesn't help that there's tons of people out there who offer resume review services who really don't know what they're doing. I could do an entire video on just this topic alone and I probably will but for now, here are three things that your resume needs to have that most resumes I see don't have. The first is impact-driven results. You need to share specifically how the work you did benefited the organization. Google action words and figure out how to incorporate these into your resume. Don't just talk about what you did, talk about why it mattered. The second thing is to use metrics. Numbers stand out, but they're also hyper-specific because they speak specifically to how much impact the work you did had. The challenge is that this will be inherently harder for some positions as compared to others. For example, it's much easier for a salesperson to talk about metrics than a nanny. And I do know a nanny who broke into data. Regardless, do your best and be as creative as you can while still being honest. Metrics really can boost up your resume if you can get them in there. The third thing is brevity. Recruiters spend an average of 15 seconds per resume. So if yours isn't simple and to the point, then it's gonna get passed up real quickly. The biggest and most obvious problem I see with resumes is loads and loads of text. I see resumes with 10 plus bullet points per roll, tons of run on sentences. We're talking five plus page long resumes. And even if yours isn't that wild and crazy, you could still probably benefit from some editing. You need to keep your wording simple and direct. And I have two great tools for this. 
The first is the Google XYZ resume formula. And it goes like this, accomplished X as measured by Y by doing Z. It helps to provide some structure to your writing. Just go ahead and Google it to see how you can use it along with some examples. The second thing is Hemingway Editor. This is one of my favorite tools. You just copy and paste your text into the editor and it provides suggestions on how you can improve your writing. The key is to keep your wording simple and it gives you suggestions on how you can do this. And the more simple your writing is, the better the reading level. That's a little copywriting 101 tip, but it's a great tip for resumes as well. You're marketing yourself through your resume, so you want it to be simple to the point and easy to read. So now let's go on to point number four. You don't interview very well. Let's say you have all three of the things we already talked about on lockdown. You have the skills, projects are awesome, your resume looks good, you're the ideal candidate. But then you interview and the hiring manager goes, oh, this person is not a good fit. That's the worst thing that could happen, but it happens all too often. One thing that I think many people often don't realize is that interviewing is an actual skill. I often hear from people, I can't get an offer despite all the interviews I'm doing. And one thing that I think is, well, have you considered that you're just not very good at interviewing? That's not always the problem, but sometimes it is. In fact, it often is. You might be good on paper, but if you're awkward, you ramble, you can't share about your experiences very well, then you're gonna have a tough time convincing them that you're a good fit. By contrast, if you are good at interviewing, then talking through your experience and showing the soft skills that you have through the interview can often make up for some technical deficits even. People want to work with people they like. And if you can show them that you're someone who not only has the skills, but is likable and has, again, those soft skills, then you're positioning yourself as a better candidate. When I got my first job in data, I was told by my manager that they interviewed people who were more technically advanced than I have, but I interviewed better than all of them. I had some of the soft skills they were looking for, and that was the deciding factor in hiring me. So here's some quick suggestions on how you can get better at interviewing. First is to have a brief two to three minute intro statement about yourself. This is how you handle the tell me about yourself question, and the way you answer it can set the tone for the entire interview. Number two is using the STAR method for behavioral question answers. STAR method goes situation, task, action, result. Memorize some question responses using that method and you can use those to answer a variety of different questions and just have them in your back pocket. Three is study the job description and the company before the interview. This is how you show companies that you've done your research and they like to see that. The last thing is ask three to five questions at the end of the interview. This gauges more of your interest in the role and the company, but it also extends the interview, giving you more time to talk about yourself or just talk to the hiring manager in general. If you do these four things, I guarantee you will interview better than you did before. Now let's go over our final point. No one knows you exist. This is where your personal brand comes in. And no, I don't mean becoming a content creator. I just mean leveraging social media to get noticed and get your foot in the door at target companies. You can do this by posting on LinkedIn about your career journey or the things that you're learning. Posting about technical skills is especially helpful. You can reach out to employees at target companies for virtual coffee chats. I've seen this work really well for a lot of people. You can reach out to hiring managers who post about roles on LinkedIn. So you can do this by typing in the search bar something like hiring data analysts, filtering to post from that day, and just kind of scrolling through looking for legit posts from people posting about actual roles. This is a great way to get in touch directly with the person posting about the role. And the last thing is engaging with the overall data community, again, through LinkedIn, doing this through commenting, again, posting, sending messages, just building an overall network of genuine connection. These are all ways that you could increase your reach aside from just cold applying. It doesn't hurt and there's literally no downside to trying out any of these strategies. And there you go, five reasons why you might not be seeing results in the data job hunt and what you can do about it. I'll have some links in the description for some of the resources we talked about today. If you enjoy the video, please like and subscribe as it does support the channel. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.